Hello, welcome to today's lesson. Today we're going to be talking about measures of central tendency and measures of spread. I hope you enjoy today's lesson. Moving along in our discovery of statistics, let us now talk about measures of central tendency. The first measure of central tendency we're going to talk about is the mode. The mode simply means the most frequent class of data. For example, if we're looking at shoe size, it would be maybe a 10 for boys. The most common shoe size would be 10, so that would be the mode. We usually only use the mode when there are no other alternatives. For example, if the question is, what is your favorite TV show? We can't use median or mean. It makes the most sense to use mode there. But again, it's our last choice. The next measure of central tendency I want to talk about is the mean. The mean is simply the average. Another word is average. And to find the mean, we add all the data and then we divide by the number of entries. So symbolically, we could say it's the sum of our data divided by n, the number of entries, or if you want to think of it as 1 over n times the sum, this big E symbol means the sum of all of our entries. Alternatively, you could think of it as the sum of the frequency of each entry times the value of each ent entry divided by the sum of the frequencies. Well, this is all that means is the sum of the frequency times the entry divided by the sum of the frequencies. Well, what does that mean? If I have the data 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3 for ages of children in a preschool, for example, I could certainly add them up and get 14 divided by 6, so I'd get 14 over 6 or 7 over 3 or 2 and 1 third would be my average. Of course, you can find the answer like that. We could also use this and say, well, it's the sum of the frequency times the value. Well, my value is 1 times its frequency is 1 plus that means we're going to sum it. The value is 2 times a frequency of 2 plus a value of 3 times a frequency of 3 all divided by the sum of the frequencies. Well, my sum of the frequencies is 1 and 2 and 3. So that's divided by 6, which will still give me 14 over 6. It's the same concept. Another measure of central tendency is the median. How do you find the median? Well, the first step is to arrange all the data in order from small to large. This is a step that younger students often forget. You have to do that. And after the data has been arranged, and only then, do you select the middle item. Well, that gives us two situations. What if the data set is even? I have an even number of entries. Well, if that's the case, I take the median of the two middle entries. For example, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 entries here. So my fourth and my fifth entries... I'm going to take the median, uh, sorry, I'm going to take the mean of those two. 12 plus 14 divided by 2 will give me 13 is my median. What if the data set is odd? Well, an odd number can be represented as 2 times n plus 1. That will always give you an odd number. The median is add 1 to that and then divide by 2. For example, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 entries here in this data set. That means I'm going to take 5 entries, which represents 2n plus 1 because it's an odd number, I'll add 1 and divide by 2, and I get 6 over 2 is 3. So my third entry, 1, 2, 3, that is the median. Of course, you also see there's a balance of 1, 2 entries below and 1, 2 entries above. If I have a curve like this, we say that this has a normal distribution. It has an average or a mean right in the middle, and about half of my data is to the right and half of my data is to the left, and it has symmetry about the mean here. Well, if I have positively skewed data, it means that I've taken some of this data on the high side, and I've sort of pulled it this way. For example, positively skewed might look something like this, and we tail off a little bit to the right. That's positively skewed data. Conversely, if I take this data and I pull it this way a little bit, so my mean is still in the middle there, but I'm pulling this way just a slight, slight bit, then I still have my mean there and it pulls to the left. That's what we call negatively skewed data. So if I'm pulling my normal curve this way with more data below the mean, I've negatively skewed the data. If I pull my data this way with more values to the right or larger than my mean, I'm positively skewing my data. The first measure of spread I want to talk about is called variance. Well, by definition, variance is the sum of, I'm going to add them all up, our individual data entries minus the mean. We just learned how to calculate the mean a few slides ago. 
And well, some data entries may be, may be below the mean and some may be above the mean. Well, if you have data entries below and above the mean, they're always going to cancel each other out. So we get a sum of these equal to zero if we did not square them. Because some are lower than the mean and some are higher than the mean, of course we have to square them to make them all positive. So the entry minus the mean, because we're going to square it, will make our difference between our entries and the mean a positive number. We're going to add those all up and divide by the number of data. Symbolically, the number of data is the sum of all the frequencies of all the data. And what are we going to do? We're going to take the sum of our entry minus the mean, that little u-shape is the mean, squared, and we're going to multiply each of those by the frequency which way, which, with which they occur. This is the way we say the sum of the data entry minus the mean squared. It's our value minus the mean squared multiplied by the frequency that that comes up divided by the sum of frequencies will be the total number of data. Variance is very closely related to something called standard deviation. We often use standard deviation because it's in the same units as our mean. Mean and variance are not in the same units because these are squared. Standard deviation is in the same units as the mean. Well, how do we find standard deviation? The sum of our data minus the mean squared, so it's all positive, divided by the number of data, so that's what this expression represents. If I take that, that is variance. Well, how do I find variance? How do I go variance to standard deviation? I take the square root of variance, so I put a big square root sign there, and that is standard deviation. It's sort of like the square root and the squares have undone each other. And so because it's square to here, we're going to wind up with a positive number. So the sum of our data minus the mean squared divided by the number of data, if I take the square root of that, that is standard deviation. Let's do an example to find the measures of spread, including variance and standard deviation. If I'm given this data set, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven data items. The middle one, the tenth, will be my median. If I add them all up, I get 70 divided by 7 also gives me 10 for a mean. So 10 is both the median and the mean. How do I find variance? I have to sum the square of my deviations. So I have 4 minus 10 squared plus 6 minus 10 squared plus 8 minus 10 squared plus 10 minus 10 squared plus 12 minus 10 squared plus 14 minus 10 squared plus 16 minus 10 squared. The first thing I have to do is sum the deviations. Well, I'm going to divide all of the sum of my deviation by how many there are. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 data items. Well, this will give me 4 minus 10 is 6 squared is 36 plus 6 minus 10 is 4 squared is 16, plus 8 minus 10 is 2 squared is 4, plus 10 minus 10 squared is 0 squared, which is 0, plus 12 minus 10 is 2 squared is 4, plus 14 minus 10 is 4 squared is 16, plus 16 minus 10 is 6 squared is 36, all divided by 7. When I get to this point, I just have to total my numerator, which works out to 112 divided by 7 which is 16. So I know my variance is 16. And I know the relationship between variance and standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of variance, which is, in this case, we'll just take the principal root of 4, because our variance and our SD will always be positive, because we squared, we squared the differences here. Another measure of spread would be to use quartiles. Now you think of a dollar has four quarters, means 25% of each part of the dollar are represented in the four different parts of the dollar if you line up four quarters in a row. The same principle holds for quartiles of data. How do we find quartiles? Well, first order the data and find the median. That's what we call quartile two. Another word for the median is quartile two. It separates the data into a lower half and the upper half. Well, considering just the upper half of the data, we can take the the median of the upper half, which is known as the upper quartile, also called Q3. Again, we're left, if we take the first median and we divide the data into two subsets, the lower subset also has a median, and that's called the lower quartile, or Q1. 
one. What is the interquartile range? Simply the upper quartile, Q3, minus the lower quartile, Q1. In each of the four quartiles, you have 25% of the data. The quartile system goes hand in hand with a box plot. Here's a box plot for a given set of data. I don't know what the original set of data is, and I don't know what it's measuring. But I do know that at this center line, we have quartile 2, or the median of the data. And I know that 25% of my data lies in here, because here is quartile 1. And I know that 25% of the data lies in here, which is quartile 3. If asked to find the interquartile range, I would take 50 minus 25, or 50 minus 26, and I get an interquartile range of about 24. Well, here is the final quartile here, and we have 25% in this quartile here, and we've got 25% in this quartile here. My minimum here is represented by the end of the whisker, and my maximum here is also represented by the end of the whisker. So the data goes from about 11 to about 57.